Welcome to Inside the Firm, a podcast dedicated to small business owners and hosted by entrepreneurs, Alex Gore and Lance Psycho. Each week, they take you on their journey of how to start, run, and grow a business by bringing you inside their architecture and real estate development firm. Get a behind the scene tour of how these business leaders manage their clients and foster company culture while creating new and innovative projects. And now your hosts, Alex Gore and Lance Psycho. Gore is hopeful his design will help give Colorado a leg up. In the meantime, he's content to dream an unlikely, if not impossible, dream that Bezos will one day reply to his emails and pick the small Longmont firm for the job of a lifetime. Successful bids are based on the merits of the area and a sound business strategy from the from the company doing the searching, Erickson said. Not gimmicks like free desert plants or A-shaped buildings. <laughs> How does that make you feel, Al? It makes me feel okay. <laughs> How oh. did it make you feel right away? And let's say it was 5.15 in the morning. Oh, yeah, because I called you, <laughs> and you were upset because apparently... <laughs> so Al Gore, as everybody knows, a.k.a. Little Jocko, yeah. gets up every day. 4.34? No, I try to hit 4.45. Uh, still but still impressive. Still impressive. So Little Jocko it, over here five, yeah, five. before 5. Little, yeah, but I don't hit. Little Lance over here. Lance. He now has teenagers, and he is he is trying to get more sleep. Yes. He still gets up between, uh, I would say, 5... Five and six thirty, somewhere in there, varies yep. every day. I don't, I don't have a regiment like you. Anyway, uh, we both read the article, and then Al proceeded to call me well, before an ounce of coffee was inside of me. <laughs> in, in all fairness, you did text me, mm-hmm. so <laughs> that is that is fair. And that is fair. It's, like, it's, what yeah. are you doing? <laughs> I have not had coffee. I'm hanging up on you. <laughs> so I think I started screaming. <laughs> oh, he was pissed, uh, and rightly so, uh, because I think. Um, so uh, I, the reason why, why I started out that read is, a I'm, I'm weird and I want to be weird on this this episode of Inside the Firm, but it, I felt like I was diving into a story. I really liked it. Oh yeah, sorry to interrupt you. Now you know how it feels. No 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 no. no. <laughs> I felt like when you were doing the intro, oh. I was diving into oh, good, a story. Good 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 good. Yeah okay. Yeah. Now you don't know how it feels. Exactly. Uh, I'm still gonna do it. <laughs> <laughs> So the so the uh, the real reason why I brought that up is because I think it's a good example of for us to talk about how to turn a first of all the press the press is the press and this is this is this is this just goes to show how they skew people's words to however they want they will cut and paste and copy and do all of your things so again um, I would encourage everybody when they think about their social media for their small business that is your media outlet that is your voice that is that is the way you can correct the mainstream media yep and. The, the I was first upset just because of the word gimmick. Because I was like, this is not a gimmick. This is um, us trying to see how it would fit in, in the city and what it could look like and use real design principles and all that stuff. Um, but anyways, so then initial reaction and what really counts is what you do with that initial reaction. So I, I, I wrote her an email. And I don't want to come across like... And who, like, and who her, who her is, is, is the is the person, uh, so just everybody knows. The little excerpt that I read was out of the Daily Camera. On, I think it was on Monday. Was it Monday? Something. Yeah. And we don't we don't need to say names, but there was a it was just a person. Exactly, that's what I'm saying. It, it, it's a person. You, you can yep. go read the article. It's public. Um, if you go to if you just type in Daily Camera F9 Productions, you could go find it, and we'll yeah. probably put it in the show links. How about our yeah, show, show notes? Show notes. Anyways, but I didn't write her an email to say it's not you know a gimmick or anything like that. I took a different approach, and started out the email. Uh, hi hi blank. I wanted to take the opportunity to introduce myself and F9 Productions, um, as you were cited in the, you know, uh, in, in, the, in the article. And then all I did was describe our firm, what we did, and then said, you know, our Amazon concept was meant to answer uh, questions for the public, not as part of some official bid. We'd be happy to meet with you at our office and see how we could help out you and her organization and then, and then I did get a little snidey yeah, remark. Yeah, you did. I was going to say, you're so full of it. <laughs> In a non-gimmick way. And for the record, I wanted to bold it. We didn't bold it. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so. Bold that. Bold that. Like, no. Uh, <laughs> this is good, though. This is, this is why, again, I think it's good to have a two-headed dragon. You know, yes. two, at least like a part, two partners. I think it's helpful. Yeah. Um, because then like one person goes way to the extreme like I did. Like, let's bold that. And I think yeah. it, it at least allowed you to go down that path of like 
should we bold that? Right. You know, exactly. Anyway, it's got an amazing response. Um, she, uh, she said she was meaning to reach out and contact you, uh, contact me. She wants to apologize for how the quote came off that it was taken out of context. See, uh, and, and, and this was, uh, this was a great reason why I'm glad I contacted her because I'm sure I'd run into her at a meeting at, you know, who knows? So, yeah. And to uh, kind of give everybody a perspective zooming out is, you know, Longmont, we operate in Longmont. It is a city of a hundred thousand, maybe tops. Yeah. And we are the biggest firm and it doesn't take much because we only have 10 people here, 12 people total. Yeah. Um, so it, it, with a small town like that, that's what Alex is getting at with like, we're going to, we're going to eventually meet this person. I mean, you, who knows if she, maybe she has a child of your age, you know, your that's children's cool. age and then yep. you guys meet that way. I, there's people that we work with all the time in the city that I'm like, oh, I go to the, my kids go to the same school and we we're at the, we're at the luncheons. Yep. So she said first, my first quote was, I thought, um, your private sector architecture firm. Uh, that the tactics uh, of your building were pretty genius and very creative. Um, and then two in a separate uh, quote, she said that different organizations other than hers, like cities uh, uh, changing the town names and st stalling giant Amazon boxes were gimmicks. Um, so they kind of mashed her words together. Yeah, they, they exactly. And so the specific city she was talking about, like I think Phoenix offered up free plants and then there was a city in Georgia that said they were going to rename it and then they were going to make Bezos the mayor. <laughs> you know, I get it. Like, I actually really like crazy stuff like that and gimmicks. I mean, we're suckers for gimmicks, right? I'm a huge sucker. If you put, a, if you put an American flag on, on a Bud Light, anything. <laughs> anything. I'm buying it. <laughs> Purchased. <laughs> Send Amazon. I'll, <laughs> I'll use Amazon. Yeah, literally. <laughs> Anyways, uh, she wants to come to our office. I'm sure we'll be just fine. All that. So what was cool. So what's cool is we turned... What we initially thought of as a negative and the way the, the press did portray a negative, it's a great icebreaker and a reason for us to get in touch with somebody else and build the network. Yep. Exactly. Uh, yep. Um, and I didn't feel the need to correct the newspaper or anything like that because I think if people, people who see it and saw it, people make up their own mind regardless. So it'd be like, it's not really a gimmick. No matter it's what a, you put out, yeah. you just, you cannot control how everybody reacts. They're yep. just going to do what they want to do. Yeah. Trust me, I'm a meme lord. Mm -hmm. um, all right. He has a shirt. So <laughs> it's true. Yep. Yep. So I like gimmicks too. So I have, I have one more one more thing to read to you. Okay. Okay. I'll close my eyes and go into dreamland. Good. Go, come come voice. take a journey with us. <clears throat> this is from the Denver Post and this was published on Halloween. Governor Colorado governor calls chances of Amazon HQ coming here a long shot, says Time Zone, is state's biggest disadvantage. So, uh, Governor John Hickenlooper called the prospects of Colorado landing online retail giant Amazon's highly touted second quarters a long shot, saying the state's biggest disadvantage could be its non-East Coast time zone. Yeah. Quote, we're a long shot, but I feel more confident every day. The Democrat told reporters on Tuesday afternoon, quote, it's like getting ready to go into a big game. I like that. Uh, Hickenlooper said he feels like the state and Denver specifically has about a t 15 to 20 percent chance of getting what is being called Quote, HQ2. I look, uh, quote, I look at the other cities that we're competing with other states, and I got to say, I'm not saying we're better, a better state or a better city than any of them, but I think we bring things to the table that none of them do, he said. He added, there's a lot of talk that they might want to be on an eastern time zone. I think that's our biggest disadvantage. Uh, the state said earlier this month, submitting its proposal to lure Seattle-based Amazon in the up and the up to 50,000 jobs it could bring to the dozens of cities hoping to get the second headquarters, Colorado's economic development officials citing a non-disclosure agreement with Amazon have declined to divulge the final details of their pitch. Amazon did not require that cities submitting requests for the HQ2 be in the each East Coast. However, J.J. Ament, chief executive officer of the Metro Denver Economic Development Corp., said he too has heard speculation that Amazon might be seeking out an East Coast city, but that if it were really a disqualifier, he said. The company would have only sought proposals from communities that fit the geographic mold. And then he goes on to say that he's heard mm -hmm. speculation about everything. Um, and you know, then he l l said something about pos that he's positive that hey, we're the only place in the United States where you can effectively do business in Europe and Asia in the same day. You can't do that in Seattle. You can't do that in Boston. So what do you wow. think? What do you think about that take? What's uh, your hot take on that take? First. Uh, uh, for, for, I do think that East Coast is very logical for them to be in. Two, in Denver, I have talked to people in uh, Europe and in Asia. Because we have farm stuff out for renderings. 
for renderings. And then also I worked at the intro to, to my book was a guy from, uh, oh, that's right. the UK. I think, the and UK. then I talked to some Spain people about some different things mm-hmm. and Israel. And, and it was cool. It was cool. And our engineer goes to Europe all the time and, and you go, you were in Italy. So yep. Doing, it, doing Italian stuff. That's a, that's a strong sell that I did not think about is that you can reach both of those people while they're working, which I think would be huge. But I just think that if they're on Seattle, they might go to the, go to the East coast just to separate it. But honestly, for, for bringing millennials in Denver is your cell. Denver is your cell. If it's not, if it's not New York or maybe Chicago, Chicago's uh, a close Chicago. Yeah. But, but, but the property taxes are so high that people are moving from Chicago and California to places like Denver because yeah. we're still not Californicated yet. So uh, my, my take was I, I'm, I'm disappointed at like, uh, I get why Hickenlooper would say that um, from political purposes because there's been rumors that he might run in 20, 2020 uh, as or he might at least primary and see, oh, really? see how far he can get. Yeah, yeah. he is. He, w- he is a pretty good candidate. I mean, you know, I don't hear bad stuff really. Yeah, exactly. And, and he's people a like o- to be negative, so right. He's a business owner and all that stuff. So I I could see why he wouldn't want to throw another city under the bus. It makes sense. But at the same like New ta- Jersey. Yeah, but at the same. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't even catch that. <laughs> Seriously. <laughs> Seriously, Jersey, what are you doing? What are you doing? Well, that's a good point. Now, would Chris Christie, would Chris Christie be as nice? No. He literally goes in like front of people's like confronts people like in stands of Babe's baseball stadiums. Yeah. So my point is I think there's a way to be positive without crapping on other cities. So I'm a, I'm disappointed from that perspective because I think we have as good a shot as anybody. I don't know about this 15 to 20 percent. Like nobody knows what percentage we have. Yeah. Well, 15 to 20 percent is is actually, if you think about it, that's, that's pretty really, good. That's pretty good. Um, what do you think? So what's your speculative? What percentage do we really have? Not I'm, I'm in us, the same. Colorado. I'm in the same for Colorado. J- just because I, I don't think they're accounting too. I don't know how the public is um, in other places and the. <laughs> Colorado is a little bit scary in that the public, the public is no, I don't know because I, I come from the, the North and you know, North Dakota and the Midwest and they're very anti-progressive too. So it's it just that some detractors have, have loud voices, but I bet you that's everywhere. I bet you that's everywhere. I don't know. Maybe not New Jersey since there's nothing. I, the the only there. place I I'm could just see. kidding. I'm just, <laughs> <laughs> I'm just the only kidding. place I could see it being, really positive and I wish your sister had a good uh, handle on this would be Texas because Texas is so pro business. I mean yeah. there's a reason why they are just crushing it continually with the economy they have their lack of regulations, their pro business attitude, land is cheap, it's very developer friendly. Well, I can see a Texas or Florida play just because uh Jeb e- well no, e- Elon's in uh <laughs> Musk is in Texas, um, just because Houston is there for space, and oh uh, yeah, that and, makes sense. And Bezos is in uh, Florida because space is there too. So I don't mean the space connection. I mean there there can be places that cultivate um, through their zoning and, and and whatever proposals that they're giving. You know, a seven billion proposal that okay, we have to go there because this is going to be the established place for something like that. So that's where I think if you think about moving to a place yeah. or recruiting. It's Colorado. You know, if you're thinking about, you know, like a culture of a brand of this is where our headquarters is, it, 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 the new one is, it, the answer is Colorado. But if you look at those other factors, it might be, well, $7 billion, New Jersey, or a hub in Florida. I guess it's it's Florida, you know. I don't know. That's why they don't pay me to make these decisions. Yeah, they just, they just nobody pays you to even make the concepts. No. <laughs> <laughs> they don't. <laughs> You know what's so last thing about the Amazon and we'll shelf it for this for this episode is uh so we we got a lot of good press as everybody who follows this podcast probably knows uh, which is great we have like on our Facebook page we have these awesome videos now that just make us look like we look like a little news organization it's hilarious yeah. but the only annoying thing is we've got a lot of solicitations from like building product suppliers now uh, I mean non-stop non-stop they just and my and my linkedin connections have went through the roof like yeah because i posted on there too so i don't know it, it, it's just funny like in hindsight and seeing what what this is stirred up yeah did i tell you that i told the guys because one came in semi unannounced 
Um, and it worked out in the end, but I told him that I cannot join the meeting and, and all that. Um, but I told the guys at the end, if, if it's going too long, because they said five, 10 minutes and it was an hour and a half, like you can leave, you can get up and you can leave if you have stuff to do. Say, hey, I'm sorry. I thought this was only going to be a half hour. I got stuff to do. Here, here, here. And I will back you up. I will back you up. I mean, unless we do a planned one where we invite and everyone knows it's a Friday lunch and learn. Man, walk away. Tangential story. So one of these products, so this particular building product manufacturer that Alex is talking about, one of our guys then proceeds to flip the meeting, which is hilarious. And I would encourage anybody to do this if they get annoyed with it. With it. Not annoyed, just maybe you don't have the time. Maybe you just don't have the time. Yeah. So it's a give and take, right? One of our guys who does all of our well, building information. They monitor. false advertised the amount of time it would take. There you go. They said it would take 10 minutes. It That's took an hour. Them. One of our guys turns the meeting and tries to, tr- tries to sell him on us creating their uh, BIM models. And then we get a call the next day and said, oh, yeah, they're interested, you know, that they want us to do it. So we might actually get business in that way. Yeah, that's what made me happy. It was hilarious. So, like, I, I don't know. Business is incredible because it's just it's what you make it. I mean, if you can take any kind of opportunity or, or negative opportunity, if you can call it that, and turn it into something cool. Yes. Yep. Um, okay. I, I, I have a couple follow-ups from last podcast that I want to tell people about. Go for it. So we talked about at least two things. I'm sure we talked about more, but mm-hmm. when we talked about selling plans, right? Yep. So, uh, Arky speak covers this in episode 66. Um, the whole thing is about a guy who's done it. Um, it, it's amazing. So listeners go out and, and listen to that. If you're interested or thinking about doing plans, you know, for your firm, check, check that one out. He, he talks about numbers, how many he produces, how he got traffic. All that stuff. And on that note, one thing I want to mention is Alex brought this up. I don't know. We were just driving or something. And he said, what's interesting about doing work like that, where you're, you're, maybe you're trying to sell your plans is you have the time to do it in a recession, but the problem is, is you probably aren't going to be able to sell those during a recession. So for, I don't know if anybody else thinks like this, but Alex and I do is we try to, we try to always have a bank of, okay, recession ideas. The next one's coming. How can, what, now we'll have time to do these extracurricular projects keep us busy keep our minds going keep fresh keep in the news all that kind of stuff but know that we think the stuff that stuff that you do is not going to pay off maybe for another three four years afterwards exactly exactly and that wasn't covered in the podcast that was just our analysis yes. Of, yes. of what's going on um second one we talked about i asked you what drives you so they did a, a, a podcast number one, uh, 117 called motivation. I think at about the 17 minute mark, they, they get into it. So go listen to that because they talk about the book, um, uh, drive by, can you look this up while I'm talking about, I think it's Daniel pink. Um, but I'm probably getting that wrong and there's, you am I, you perfect. It. You nailed it. <clears throat> so anyways, go listen to that and I'll just give you a, a, a brief, it's deeper than what I'm going to tell you, of okay. course. So, uh, carrots and sticks, right? That's how you think motivation, you know, happens, but that only works in very little situations. And they describe like what situations it works for. A lot of times it works the opposite to the, to the detriment, right? So it works in, Hey guys, we got to do these details. I I know they suck. We just got to bury our heads, go through it for the week. And then you get, you know, like a bonus. But other than that kind of specific case and how you frame it, normally it, it does not work. Okay. What does work is internal motivations. And we probably heard of this concept, but I thought the three points that he explains in the book, uh, really illuminate what's going on. So the three points are people are motivated by autonomy, mastery, and focus. Um, God, I don't think that last one is right. Purpose. It's purpose. I wrote it down wrong. Okay. So. Think about some of the projects that me and you have been doing. Autonomy, meaning like they'd like to be left alone to just do their job? Yeah. Hmm, that makes sense. So what, what, one of the things I brought up in last podcast was develop a skill. Like that's where it comes from is developing a skill. Well, that... And then you want to master it. And, and, and then that is the mastery, right? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. But how these are linked, which I thought was cool, was how you develop the skill and how we develop a, school, a skill with our students is after we give them the tools, teach them a template is that we say now design your own thing using what you just learned. And I think that's the pivot point that transitions them to discover new stuff. So their purpose is that they get to design something that they want and they have autonomy to actually do it. And then that leads back to mastery, right? So the fun projects that me and you wanna do are the ones where uh, 
uh, they have a purpose, like the Amazon headquarters. I think that's cool to design a skyscraper. I think I, I'm not a master at skyscrapers. I'm, uh, I have a skill at bringing design and concepts to life. Um, and then I was autonomous. I was free to do it however I wanted, right? Mm -hmm. And so I just think that that was an awesome explanation of drive because I was very driven to do that. And there's things that you are doing that I think match in those three, mas you know, mastery, purpose, and then you're free to do it. Yeah. And that's what the you like to do. The freedom is huge. Yeah, the freedom part is huge. I totally get that. Freedom equals happiness. Yeah. All that, all that long. Yeah. For sure. And discipline equals freedom. Boom! Little Jocko. Cool. That's cool. Yeah, check those out. Arky Speak is great. Yeah. Uh, are we on to best and worst advice? We are. Fantastic. It, our bestie. No, no, no. Not our bestie. Oh, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. That's not our bestie. So okay. we have to wait for our bestie. Nick. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We save so, our we save the best for we save the best for later. Yeah. Uh, so today, our best and worst advice segment is brought to you by John Odermatt. John is a Facebook friend of mine, Lance, and a fellow podcaster who hosts a very cool show called Felony Friday. So yes, everybody check it out. He's got some amazing, amazing stories of where he interviews uh, ex felons and their struggles and how they how they've you know the justice system was pinged against them and then now how they've turned their life around and started to do really positive things really like i listen to those with my kids on sunday usually the episodes and because they're not you know they're not um they're not vulgar or anything they just open their eyes and i've had my kids several times have said they go dad stop that did that is that really happening to people and it just op gives, gives them like this amazing perspective that I, I don't know how, how else I could give it to them. Yeah. You know what I love about promoting other people's podcasts is what Dan Carlin said. So Dan Carlin was talking about small podcasters starting and the big people got in. And it's not the same as traditional news media because we don't have time blocks. You were not competing at five versus another show. It doesn't matter. You, you have to be good enough to capture someone's attention. So it's actually all on you. I also you think it doesn't, honestly, it doesn't matter to be timeless either. For some people, that's a huge thing. Like they want to create these timeless podcasts. Yeah. I think, I think it, a lot of people don't care because our podcasts come out and people, some people don't listen to them. Some people listen to them front to back, zero to 36 now. Yeah. Just all, and they just binge and they just love it. Yeah. That's uh, the best way I like to, if I find a good podcast, yes. I, I, I start from the, the beginning. But anyways, it, it's just a cool dynamic that it, uh, you can share and it, it's not hurting. It's not like if you, if someone listens to someone else's, they're taking away from yours. No, they're probably just listening to more and more podcasts, you know, yep. on the weekends. Yep. Uh, so you'll love this, Sal. John is a Penn State grad and I think oh. he's a season ticket holder too, which is sick because I would love to go to a whiteout one day. Yeah. I'm Even so amazing. upset that they lost. In, in the fourth quarter, they I were know. winning. Oh. <laughs> no, no, no. I love Penn State. Yeah. Um, and when he's not fervently defending liberty, he defend he earns a living working in project controls for an engineering company. So with that, uh, we're going to have a little listen from our good friend, John. What's up, Lance and Alex? I want to thank you for giving me the opportunity to uh, talk on your podcast here. I also want to say, you know, I think it's fantastic what you guys are doing, using your business, using your firm uh, the experience you guys have gathered as a way to teach others. I think that's very admirable and I, I respect it. And I'm really appreciative of you giving me the opportunity to come on and share us a little bit of uh, of wisdom, hopefully. Um, I've worked for going on 12 years now here in corporate America. Um, started out working for Westinghouse in nuclear energy and I've moved into the uh, pipeline business and the uh, oil and gas business. And it's, it's been a, it's been a great learning experience, but my passion, um, well, I do enjoy my work and I, I work in risk management. That's what I do in my day job, my corporate job, my nine to five. And I have learned a lot from that, but my passion is really in a lot of the things I do outside of that, in my podcasting, in my real estate business, and in my Facebook marketing business. So there's lots of things that I do outside of just my corporate job. And that kind of relates to some of the bad advice from a college professor who told me that you know once you graduate, you get out in the real world, don't do anything unless you're getting paid for it. Honestly, at the time, I thought that was great advice because it made sense because I thought that I'm going to graduate, I'm going to be out in the real world, I'm going to have this great education and yeah, I'm going to turn, you know, turn people, if they're not going to pay me enough, I'm going to turn them down. If, or if, if it's an unpaid internship or unpaid position, I'm going to turn them down. That could, there could not be worse advice than that, in my opinion, 
because in my experience, thankfully I've learned from that, I've gotten some good advice that, that I'll talk about, it is so important to pull yourself out of your comfort zone, to stretch yourself, to put yourself in situations where you can grow, where you can learn new skills. And a lot of the times when you learn new skills, people who are new to something, people who are new to, for example, if you you know, want to start a career as a social media marketer or you want to start a career in real estate, um, you're not just going to jump into those fields and make money right away. You want to start a career in podcasting. You want to you, you want to make money and you want to get sponsors for your podcasts and, and quit your day job. Well, guess what? You are not going to make any money to start with. You're not going to get paid to start with. You're going to put a lot of time in and a lot of, a lot of hours in to learn how to podcast, to learn how to edit, to learn how to promote, to learn how to market, and you're not going to get paid a dime. But guess what? In my experience, that's some of the best experience I've had in my entire life. And it's made me a stronger person, not only in my businesses, but also in my corporate life. Because it's helped me with communication. It's gave me more confidence talking with people, presenting with people. It's just, it's good to stretch yourself. So I guess I turned that worst advice into a, a best advice. But I do want to expand on the best advice that I've received. And I received this advice when I was leaving my job at Westinghouse about five years ago. And at that time, I was working mostly in project controls, project controls, um, scheduling. I don't know if you're familiar with a a software out there called Primavera P6, P3. Um, it's you know, a way to manage projects. I'm sure uh, some, of, some of your listeners have probably heard of it. And I'm, I'm very good with Primavera and I got very comfortable with Primavera. And, you know, my friend at the time who, who had already left the company before, but he came to my going away party and he gave me some advice. Looking back on his career, he's an older gentleman, a couple decades older than me. And he said, you know what, John, you're going to be in a position where people are going to ask you to do things. They're going to ask you to work, to do a task, to to accept some responsibility that for something you've never done before. And you have to embrace that. I mean, you might have no idea where to start, but you can figure it out because, and this is the second part of good advice, because most people out there, most people in positions of authority and positions of power, not all, but most they started the same way. They didn't come into a job knowing how to do it. They didn't start a task, start a business knowing how to do it. You learn as you go. So if you get something put in front of you and it looks overwhelming, just take it a piece at a time. Ask the people around you for help if you need it, but don't be intimidated by it because that, that is the greatest opportunity to learn right there in front of you. And we need more of that. And Lance and Alex, I want to thank you so much for inviting me on your show. Good luck with the show. Okay, I, I think that was awesome. And his first part, it, I guess it was advice, but I think it was more of a reminder. Because a lot of people... How do our guests every single time align with what we're doing at the same, at that time? I don't know. It blows my mind. Yeah, it's great. Uh, we plan it out. <laughs> <laughs> um, but to remind people that you're not... You, if you're not making money in the beginning, that's okay. That's okay. That's normal. That's going to happen. I think, I don't think anyone has really said that before and on, on this podcast. And I think it's great. I don't think we have either. One thing that what came to mind with, for me is a sentence in it with, if it's a passion, pursue it. What could it hurt? You're not going to hurt anybody. Yep. Um, so do it. And it lines up with the autonomy and the freedom, and then the mastery, because of all those combined. There's something to having a passion and pursuing it. Is you know, as long, again, as long as it's not hurting anybody, and it's not in a derogatory way. To like, isn't the universe telling you something? Isn't the universe sort of like giving these, you these clues that you yeah. should be pursuing it? But but Lance, <clears throat> what about uh, I'm I'm doing a job that I'm not passionate about. Quit. <laughs> no. <Nope. laughs> I, on the fly. What I would say is, are you developing a skill in that? There you go. Can you put your passion in that skill so that then you can grow and have autonomy and then mastery? And then e either that translates into what you stay in the same vein or you take that to your passion. So even if it's something mundane like... Um, um, I, I don't I, I don't know because everyone can, can find something good in their job. But let's say you're just picking up trash, okay? But then what if you are now not only picking up trash and you're leading people, you're organizing, you're being motivated, someone sees you, now you're head of 
the people picking up trash. Oh, you know? now I see what you're getting. I'm so sorry for being dense. Yeah. <laughs> so my when I when I moved to Colorado, I hated my job. I hated my job, but I picked up a, the skill of I said I'm going to master Revit. And look at it's you. just look been, at you. I know now. it's just been paid. It's just paid paid dividends. Paid yeah. dividends. Yeah. You need a Revit tattoo. <laughs> Do I really? Yeah. <laughs> Match your dragon tattoo. <laughs> It's been how many podcasts and I haven't brought up your dragon tattoo? Oh, man, yeah. It was one half of my chi. Yeah. Yep. We need to fix that. <clears throat> Second part. You can figure out. Totally believe in that. I got that same advice when I was in Montana. Just say yes and figure it out. Because time plus your intensity, which is your focus, plus the help, meaning your mentors or where you're getting that information, equals mastery, right? It's just a, it's a formula. Um, and most of the things that you do are not rocket science. And most of the things that you do, you can boil down into a smaller chunk, exactly what he's talking about. No matter what you're doing, you'll have a team, hopefully, around you. If you, let's say you want to build an app or do something crazy, what you don't know is that it, just you building an app, being that one person building an app, that's one fifth of the, the issue. Another is, you know, is the app good? Do you have any skills in, in connecting with an idea? Can you reach out to people? Can you run a business? Then can you make the app? And then inside the app is it, it's not just the app, but then it's the graphics, meaning Photoshop or illustrator and all that. So like realize that there's pieces and then chunk those pieces into tasks or join with a group to get it done. Yeah. Awesome. Thanks so much for being uh, on, John. I don't think I've ever, I've never told you this, but you have a wonderful radio voice. So it, it was is great to have you on. Hopefully, we'll have you on again um, because I know we had to cut. We, you and I were chatting, and we had to we had to cut three minutes out of your segment because you said once you get in your soapbox, it's hard to get you off. <laughs> but I but it's good. It was it was a very good piece. So uh, yeah. okay, with that, are we on to Bestieville? Bestie, Bestieville, Bestieville. Nick Renard coming at you live. Here we go. Hello, best friends. I hope you had a great week this week. A reading. Guardians. Every firm has a brand. Firms with a brand rooted in deep values do best over the long run. They are self-confident about who they are. Their clients pay to access the results produced by them. And their successful culture attracts top talent. It takes effort, energy, and investment to organically grow a powerful brand. You have to pay attention to it. It is your leadership's team's responsibility to be the guardians of the galaxy. Uh, Wait, I mean of your brand. The only sustainable advertising or promotion comes from out-innovating the competition. With better quality solutions, better service, keen attentiveness, and more knowledge of your customer's industry, you win. Leaders must understand the brand, share it, and strengthen it. The best leadership teams respect the value of a high-performance brand and know that laziness and caring for it will slowly destroy it. They are serious about being the brand's guardian. Once again, our Gensler. Al, Johnny loves you. You love Johnny. Show Johnny you still love him, even though he's losing his mind. Toodles! We're going to figure it out one of these days. <laughs> so if, if everyone's not aware, his little sayings at the end, apparently he doesn't just pull out of the sky, which I thought he pulled out of, out of the sky randomly. <laughs> so if anyone knows where he's... Or somewhere deeper, I mean. Well, I didn't want to say that, but that's where it's coming from. It's warm air, okay? Where, where you, please let us know where these are coming from. <laughs> Give us a link. Send it, it, my email, akg at I don't want to know. I don't want to know. I'll know. Okay. Let me know. I, I don't want to know. So just email me. Please let me know. <laughs> <laughs> the reason the reason I, I picked that for Nick to read was it talked about the brand, right? Brand is this you know big concept, how to guard it. But I thought it, it was key, the middle part there. The only sustainable um way to promote your brand comes from out innovating the competition Mm. with better quality solutions, better service, keen attentiveness, and more knowledge of the customer's industry. You win. So while you can think about the brand, and I think you can as logo, marketing, slogan, all that, I think that's great. And I think that solidifies it and it it gives everyone talking points so that you can be on the, on the same page. But your brand is also out innovating, making a better solution, out executing, all that other yeah. stuff. So out thinking, out thinking, constantly, yeah. constantly thinking, never stopping, uh, to never stopping to try to move things ahead, see see what's on the horizon, 
I don't know if, you know, bleeding edge is the right way. Cutting edge is, cutting edge is where you want to be, but you want to be thinking in bleeding edge. Yep. And one of uh, the phrases that I heard that, uh, I'll get the quote wrong, but it's from Napoleon. And he said his greatest strength is, you know, out thinking is, um, they asked him, uh, you know, hey, what if this happens? What if this happens? He goes, don't worry. You know, I got it covered. They're like, why? He's like, I have thought of every scenario possible. And he would just think, 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 and then play it in his head what was going to happen. Yeah. So a really good, another really good example of that is, <clears throat> if anybody follows Scott Adams, uh, Dilbert, yeah. if you go to his blog, if you go to his Twitter right now, and you you check out the top his top pin, he's getting into the cryptocurrency game, and one of the best quotes of that article that I that I like is that he said he said something to the tune of like Silicon Valley is always thinking three years ahead of everybody else. Um, so, uh, you know, the people who like arguably the internet has man has changed our lives, you know, in, in ways that we couldn't even, we couldn't even describe. And so Scott Adams is getting aboard with cryptocurrency for that same, for that same reason, because he says all the guys in, all, all the guys in Silicon Valley are that they, they think it's like the next version of the internet that's going to come out and to radically transform our society. Yeah. Very cool. Very, very cool. What do you got next, Al? <laughs> uh, Oh, I have, I have two things before code questions. One, my, my dad puts out his own blogs, which I think is awesome. Mm -hmm. And one quote in there was, give so much time to the improvement of yourself that you have no time to criticize others. Christian D. Larson. I thought that was awesome. I love that. So if you're thinking about, should I have, you know, should I go on to Facebook, do this post, ask, could I be improving myself? And what's more valuable? Second, so I thought that was a great quote. Thank you, dad. Thank you, old man river. Um, prop architecture, our friends from pop prop architecture. Do you know what he's doing till the end of the year? No, there's a, apparently there's only nine weeks left. So he's reading a book a week. Oh, cool. You did that. Yeah. Yeah. I did that after, after college. Um, but I didn't have anything to do. So I did it per day, which I do not recommend. Right. Um, so go check out, uh, his list. I'll say a couple that are on there. Uh, the one that's coming up and he'll do a summary of all this. So, you know, follow him. He's going to do extreme ownership by Jocko. So spot on, right? He's going to do our book, the creativity code, which is awesome. And he's going to do uh, Eric's book, uh, uh, architect, but plus Eric, Eric Reinhold. Yep. Plus, uh, entrepreneur. And, uh, there's other books. So, so go over there. And I wanted to talk about ideas about reading books. So the, wh the what he's proposing and what I really like about it is that you have nine, bo nine books and then you can take, if you read a concept or an idea and you read something about uh, authenticity in design in, in our book, and then all of a sudden Jocko talks about authentic leadership and then someone else talks about it. You can circle all those points and be like, wow, if this came up in three books from three Some, different Somebody's guys, trying to tell me something. It, 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 yeah. If, if there's a couple concepts I'm going to remember, that's going to be one of the concepts. So that's, that's a brilliant way to do it. Um, another way to do it is, I mean, you can just read one book and that's good. Another way, and I haven't done this, is you take a, a subject or a person. This was more for a biography. So let's say you're going to read about Steve Jobs you find three books about Steve Jobs so that you get the different perspectives so that you aren't pigeonholed. And then you can again do the same analysis where, okay, this book said something, that book said something, and they all came to the same conclusion. It wasn't just one person's perspective. But <clears throat> I wanna alert you to another way, which I think is, which, which I'm doing right now. I don't, I'm not as ambitious as these nine books, you know, before the end of the year. So what I'm doing is I'm taking one book, like Extreme Ownership, and if, if I like that book, then if they have a podcast, I will go to the podcast and I will start that from the beginning. So then it's, it's amazing because a lot of times when you're reading the book, you want to engage with the author. So then if you're listening to the podcast, you're good to go. The next book that I'm doing the same thing to is Story Brand. Um, and I would recommend this to be the 10th book uh, on that list. Uh, same thing. The book is amazing. Start the podcast from zero. Um, and if they had a website blog, I'd go read that too. So then you're taking one person and, and kind of going deep on their idea. Uh, either way is fine. I just wanted to, just wanted to bring that. I haven't, I haven't done what Alex, uh, is, is doing as far as, uh, you know, starting at the beginning of the podcast, but I really like that idea a lot. Hard, yeah. hard for me to argue against it. Yeah. Uh, cool. You ready to continue your streak? 100%. Man, this guy's on fire. All right, here we go. Code question time. I'm stretching. Good. Stretch it out. Push-ups. 
Uh, so we are in the international residential code, which is awesome because I think this can, everybody can relate to this, even if you're not an architect, because at the end of the day, you're going to own a house or you're going to be in a house and you should know what the heck is, is approved and what is not approved. Do you think if you bring up these code questions in conversation, you're going to impress the opposite sex? Absolutely. This is a perfect icebreaker for all you singles out there. Guaranteed. <laughs> or impress your wife. My <laughs> wife loved when I railed that in Star Trek, they had rivets on the uh, on the new Enterprise. I'm like, that's not how you connect steel. That's, that's an old technology. Yeah, it's not real. She loved that conversation. I bet she did. <laughs> I bet she did. I bet, I bet it enhanced the viewing of Star Trek. All right. <laughs> but then she said, yeah, but what if that works better in space? And then went, boo. <laughs> oh, my God. That's hilarious. I spit all my coffee. <laughs> uh I don't know who won that argument. I don't know either. <laughs> All right. We'll never know. All right. <clears throat> Chapter three. Figure. Rivets in space in, in it's the not future. A it's, not. it's not a thing. Let's put that to bed. It's not a thing. Come on. What kind of currency what kind of currency are they using in the in the future in space? Huh? <sighs> Bitcoin. Some Everyone kind of some kind that. of Bitcoin thing. Yeah. Come Seriously, if you're not I can't if, believe that they didn't have an architectural consultant or a structural engineer consultant. And they'd see that and be like, come on. Are you talking about the original TOS? No, I'm talking about the ones from like last year. They were in the engineering room. Mm. Exactly. Mm. It took me a while to get over that. I don't feel like I'm over it right now. <sighs> it's kind of obvious. Yeah. Yeah. One, a lot of, come on, at least some, pretend like it's carbon fiber structure or something futuristic, not old. It literally looked like your mill factories that you see. That was what was in their engineering next to their warp core and plasma generator. What? What are we doing? <laughs> I wish I could get a, upset as you about this, but I just can't. Yeah. Yeah. But then I will be <laughs> hypocritical. So have you seen Jupiter Ascending yet? Yes. Yes. And I appreciated that the spaceships were in Gothic architecture. God, you're weird. <laughs> <laughs> they had chandeliers. I'm like, I'm digging it. I'm digging it. Why not? Why not? Because they are authentic. Because it was all match the theme. You can't have plasma generators next to Rivet Connect. Have you checked? Have you watched Rick and Morty yet? No, because I don't buy this Hulu nonsense. I don't have five bucks to spare. I ain't rich like that. Mm -hmm. Questionable. Yeah. I'm thinking about buying CBS All Access so I can get the new Star Trek Discovery. That's where my purchase is going to go. Huh, because you don't have satellite. Is that why? No, I have Hulu TV now. Uh, no, no, uh, YouTube TV. And then HBO. And I got another one too. I don't know. It's All crazy. Right. There you go. Uh, all right, here we go. Back. <laughs> I think we're at code questions. So chapter three. <laughs> chapter three, figure R. 307.1. You don't need to know the figure. I'm just citing it, okay? So it's basically a drawing in the book. What is the minimum clear space that should that should be provided between the edge of a shower and a wall? A, 21 inches. B, 24 inches. C, 27 inches. D, 30 inches. Between a shower and a wall. So shower like and a wall. Going in shower and a wall. Outside of minimum, it minimum, sliding. minimum. Yep. What is the well, minimum clear space? I, um, hmm. if, it, if it's like a toilet, you know, that's about 20, 21 inches. Shower might be a little bit more just because it's not just your feet planting. Yep. I will say 24 or 30. 30 is the correct answer. Yay! Sure. Okay. Now, there's an exception. Oh. What is the minimum clear space that should be provided between the edge of a shower and an opening? So let's say you had a shower and you had to put a wall up for some reason, right? Huh? But it was going to be it was going to be less than the minimum 30 for inches. a wall, right? Mm -hmm. So you're like, okay, well, how can I get away with this? Not get away with it. How can I How can I make this code compliant? I, oh, put an opening. In the wall. In the wall. Okay. Yep. So like, let's say there's just like an opening right in front of the... Yeah. Yep. Like a door with no door. Yep. I don't know why they put this in there, but just you should know this. Okay. okay? A, 21 inches. B, 24 inches. C, 27. D, 30. So it's the same thing except you can step into an opening? It's so weird. I don't get it. Somebody, somebody, somebody hopefully tweets at us and corrects us and says, oh, yeah, I did this and it has happened. Yeah, like, but... It doesn't make any sense th to me. This is, this is where the, the codes get a, a little too nuanced and dumb because what if you have an opening, but then an inch past the opening, you have a solid wall? Exactly. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I have an opening. There's air gap in between. Uh, I, I'm going to say less. Uh, 27. 24 inches. 24. 
All right, whatever. <laughs> uh, I guess. Sure. <laughs> sure. How 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 about just don't have anything in just front? Just do 30. Just do 30. In just front. call it 30 no matter what. Or just call it clear space. If there's an opening in the wall, that is clear. There you go. See, what I don't get is like, okay, if there's an opening in front of the freaking shower, and that's a minimum of 24 inches, what? Like, didn't you, there's an opening. So like, this doesn't even apply. Why even take the time to write that? Because, yeah, it, it, and I agree with you 100%. But, <laughs> it doesn't mean, but, but so, yeah. Again, somebody's going to tweet us and we're going to go, oh, we're, we're stupid. Uh, we're stupid. Evan? Probably. <laughs> Get your tweet on. <laughs> There you go. Everybody follow us on the Facebook, the Twitter. Send us your questions, emails. Uh, if, you'd, if you'd ever like to be a guest on, on the podcast and you're a listener and you have some good and bad advice, we'd love to have you on. Right now, there's a new feature. If you go to insidethefirmpodcast.com, uh, on your right-hand side, you can send us a voicemail. Click on that. It records it. And then I think you just hit enter and it sends it right to us. So just drop us a line. All right. See you next week.